300 years ago, men, women and children were kidnapped in their thousands, stolen from Africa, brought here to South America as slaves. Hundreds of thousands died of tropical disease, overwork and brutal treatment. But some of them escaped. From the sugar plantations on the coast, they headed inland along this river to set up their own free kingdom. And I was told it still existed, deep in the heart of the South American jungle, an African paradise. To get to this particular paradise, you must first go by the way of Paramaribo. And it's here in the Surinamese capital that you first get a glimmer that the paradise down south is under threat. For beneath the surface of this seemingly laid back Caribbean community lies a heady brew of politics, money, and corruption. Some people uh, go so far as to say that what we have now is uh, that uh, the mafia is in government, <laughs> using, uh, misusing uh, public finance, public money uh, for their own purpose. The president is Jules Wiedenbosch, the man in black. But it's the man on his left, Desir Bautise, who is the power broker. Former military commander, coup leader, and ex-head of state, Botase is chairman of the ruling party. He's not elected in this notional democracy, but it's Botase who pulls the strings. And it's Botase, not the president, who gives the keynote address here, in his own inimitable style. You have uh, the chairman of the MDP, Desir Botese, currently wanted by Interpol mm -hmm. on drug charges. Surely that must be very embarrassing for the, the government. Oh, it is. In our contacts with the outside world, right now, uh, we have a very serious political situation with Holland, and the cause of that is this, uh, this Interpol uh, demand from Holland to arrest uh, Daisy Bautista on drug charges, yes. It's not the first time Bautista has offended the international community. In 1982, unhappy with criticism, he and his lieutenants rounded up 15 of his political opponents and murdered them in the local museum. He now stands accused not just of drug involvement, but of selling the country's natural resources for his own benefit. It becomes a very difficult decision if you're a poor country and you want to sell your natural resources, in this case timber, and you get a lot of money from it. Even then there is the question, uh, should you do it? Uh, uh, does all that money uh, warrant a, a destruction of this uh, valuable rainforest? But in our case, we don't, we don't even get some money from it, so it's, it's, it's criminal, actually. Having had an introduction to the political context, we headed south on our quest. The road to paradise was rough. We're traveling with Stan Malone of Conservation International, one of several groups trying to save the forests of Suriname. Just around this corner is a very nice tree coming up. The Suriname government recently proudly announced a reserve covering 10% of the country. Critics responded that this meant open slather on 90%. They also point to extraordinary deals the government has done with foreign companies. 
Many companies, especially from Asia, have been granted suspiciously cheap leases to extract timber. It's a locally registered company called Tacoba, but mainly with uh, expats from uh, China working uh, here. When a foreign company finds an exploitable resource, the locals are simply forced to move off their lands. These people have been moved before. Now it's happening again. They were moved in the name of development, just yes, uh, when it was uh, bauxite and the hydro lake had to be built. And these villages are what we call transmigration villages. We had driven south to the village of Pokigron. The rest of our journey to the furthermost and most traditional village of the Samarakan would be by river. As we headed upriver, we could hear the sound of timber cutters in the jungle. The descendants of the escaped slaves are known as Maron, from Chimaron, Spanish for runaway cattle. Understandably, they prefer to be known as Samarican. With virtually no way for an individual to earn money in this region, people are totally dependent on the jungle. Everything comes from the forest. And as Western science, the Western people know all of the plants in here. We have discovered about 17 plant species that has never been recorded. Jan Meyer is a forestry worker turned conservationist. One, one of the plant species that has been collected, they have discovered two new molecules. Molecule. In just one hectare here can be found more different tree species than in all of North America. And on one tree can be found as many species of ant as exist in all of England. We were to spend the night in Gunsi, a small Samarakan village nestled on the banks of the Suriname River. The river is apparently swarming with piranha and caiman, a type of crocodile. It adds a certain zest at bath time. But I was not really being that foolhardy. I knew that the shamans around here had put a spell on the river. The piranhas, they eat people. But uh, it seems like uh, in a cultural, spiritual way, the Samarkand people has, has them under control. There has been a death in the village, a young woman. The Samarkan people, they believe in reincarnation. Here they can control the reincarnation. Before she can be buried, this oracle is carried around the village to determine in what form she will return and asking her if she is content with her death. What is the cause of your death? Did somebody do some food black magic on you? Or have you been, been died by a natural cause? The head man, the Capitan, had agreed to let us film, but he'd made it clear that he wanted something in return. He didn't say just what. There's not much to do in Gunsi on a Friday night, in Western terms. The Capitan dropped by for an evening drink. Chief, have a drink. A courtesy call. I was half expecting a discussion on African culture, but the Capitan had other things on his mind. No, 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 I want a money apart. Who's got money? Uh, Australia and Canada. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, in the heat of the jungle night, the people of Gunsi celebrated and mourned the passing of one of their own. treatment suffered by these people's ancestors was horrific. Escaped slaves were hunted down by plantation owners, dragged back in shackles. Public hangings by meat hook, beheadings, burnings were common in the public square of Paramaribo. We were entering the most traditional area of the Samarakan. Contact with the outside world here has been quite limited. Jan had warned me that we could not film without permission. If you take a picture of one person, you can spiritually harm that person. And if you take a picture without permission, what happens? Then the whole face will beat you up. That's the worst punishment. I understand. Yeah. In the past, they used also whip, but now that's past. And so we arrived in Asindupo, and here the filming stopped. After two days of being unable to film, I was waiting for a miracle. It came in the form of the Bashar, or spiritual leader, who had come to take me for further negotiations across the river. This time, we were allowed to film. The Kabiten wanted money, and understandably. The villagers here are impoverished. They have nothing but the jungle and the river. The outside world is their only source of cash. Could you explain to him that I don't want to pay them to put on a specific show? I would prefer to only film something that is going to happen naturally, so... Finally, a deal was struck. We could film the women in the fields. We could film the women celebrating. And for final good measure, an interview with the captain himself. Good. Thank you. While the men have been negotiating, the women have been working. <laughs> the Bashar and the Kabiten then proceeded to give me what they thought I wanted, a cultural performance, a demonstration of their African traditions. But as fascinating as this time capsule of African culture might be, it was not this community's past that interested me, but its future. Last December, a group representing a logging firm owned by the Sahato family in Indonesia had suddenly arrived in helicopters under armed military escort and with official government leases to inspect the timber in this region. Did they know just before Christmas that there would be people coming with official leases and with the military? to take an inventory on the forest around here? No, they couldn't know. He doesn't like the way it had happened, mm -hmm. that they are coming here without that knowledge. Yeah. There should be an agreement between them and the government. Mm -hmm. They need to be developed. They need development in this area. They need money to buy clothing, food, and other stuff. But Exploiting the forest must, must be done in a durable way. But the people here will find it difficult to resist the advances of a wealthy multinational company. We've seen them operate in Southeast Asia and the modus operandi has been corrupting government officials and then going ahead and doing as they very well please. For the moment, the Samarakan are being spared the invasion. With economic turmoil in Asia, the companies involved have put their project on the back burner for the time being. For three centuries, these people have seen this jungle as their own, a refuge from the outside world that once enslaved them. But the outside world is closing in.